Good morning, City Light Church. My name is Gavin. I'm one of the pastors at City Light, and I want to welcome you. This is it, church. This is the day. This is Baptism Sunday, and uh, this is a celebration Sunday. Some of you guys are new. Some of you came to cheer on, champion, and celebrate some loved ones, friends, and family uh, that will be baptized here in just moments. And to you, I especially want to say welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, your support of these guys, I know, means so much to them. And so thanks for showing up. Thank you for being here. Um, I really believe Baptism Sundays, these are some of our best moments as a church. It's on these Sundays that we realize God is still alive. God is still working. God is still saving, as Chris had said. And, you know, we read about that on this ink and in this book, and it's just so refreshing to also see it in the lives of people that we know and the people that we love and the people that are right in front of us. And so this is a good, good, good day. Good day. Uh, we planted this church February 3rd of 2013. It was kind of our public launching. And I have to say, having been around from the beginning, I never thought in a million years we would have seen God do the work that he has done and continues to do. Uh, this morning, uh, we had 21 people get baptized in the first hour. We'll have nine more in this hour, and after this morning, we will have seen more than 300 people meet Jesus in salvation and get baptized just in this local little expression of the church right here in Omaha, Nebraska. And what a thrill. God is alive. Every nation of the world, every tribe, tongue, and nation, God is doing a, a work. Jesus is alive, and we get to see just a little sliver. But isn't it our joy to see people meeting Jesus, their lives really being changed for all of eternity? And so um, I, I just have to say um, for a quick moment, those of you in the church, those of you who have been here since the beginning, those of you who, who invest, who, who tithe, who disciple, who invite, who labor, who serve donuts, it's all worth it. And it culminates in moments like these when we celebrate that, that Jesus is the one doing the work. Um, but guess what? He does that work through ordinary people like you and me. He can even use a grown man with a selfie stick. I mean, the limits of his grace know no bounds. And so today is about Jesus. But I also want to affirm you, church. This day um, is a celebration of what Jesus has done through you. Uh, he's answered your prayers. He's been faithful to meet us here in this place. And so uh, thank you guys. For those of you guys who are getting baptized, can I just say thank you for taking this step of faith today? Um, when I got here early this morning, I talked to several of you and, and several of you said, you know what? I, I almost didn't make it today. I wrestled with doubts all week. I pulled into this parking lot thinking, what are mom and dad going to think? What um, are my neighbors going to think? Is this going to be on the internet? Am I really doing this? This is all so foolish, right? Um, but you listened to the voice of Jesus that said, my child, I love you. And I have saved you unashamedly. And you get into that water unashamedly. And you let the whole world know what I have done for you. And you did it. You're here, and so thank you for muting the voice of our enemy and listening to the voice of our Heavenly Father. I'm proud of you guys. I'm excited to celebrate with you today. Today is a very, very good day. Now, I have to say this. Uh, it's a good day after a really kind of a bad week. If I can change the tone and be a little more somber for just a second and recognize, if you've watched the news We've seen evil played out across the world this week. Between the terrorist attacks in, in Paris and Beirut, more than 200 people killed at the hands of ISIS terrorists. It was a very, very bad and bloody week. And it's interesting for us, if you're uh, new maybe this morning, we've been studying Genesis um, kind of this whole fall. And for the last several weeks, we've been in Genesis 3, which talks about sin, the reality of sin and evil in the world and how it got here in the beginning. And... Um, Believe me, I know, uh, to a lot of people, this sounds like a silly idea, right? Many, would people, many people would say to you and to me and do, oh, your church really believes in sin? You really believe sin is real? I mean, what an archaic and, and simple, superstitious way of thinking. You know, the human race has really evolved beyond this primitive way of thinking, and you and your church should really evolve with the rest of humanity, you know? The problem with that way of thinking is that there really is no greater explanation for what happened in our planet this week or what you and I see and experience in our everyday normal experience. 
Um, if there is no such thing as sin and evil, we can't objectively look at what happened in situations like Paris and say that's evil. That's sin. Evil on the grounds of what, you might say? Says whom? To what standard? If there is no right and wrong, there is no sin and evil, there is no good and bad, then the acts committed this week are no more wrong than you or I eating an ice cream cone or pushing your young child on a swing set. But the Bible teaches that there is a right and there is a wrong, and there is a God, and there is sin, and there is righteousness, and there is salvation, and that sin is not only what our first parents did in the garden, Adam and Eve, and taking the forbidden fruit. It's not only what those terrorists over there do, though it is. It is also in us and around us and in our very hearts and all of us as shared species Human beings share in this condition called sin, and sin divides, sin separates, sin kills. It separates us from God and from each other and from the creation that we were meant to live in a symbiotic relationship with. And so we've been talking a lot about sin. And so why talk about sin one more time on Baptism Sunday? Well, because this is the Sunday that we celebrate that Jesus has taken our sin away. That sin is real, but we have a more real reality, which is a real God who came to save us from that sin. I want to talk to you about that this morning. We're going to look one more time in Genesis chapter 3. We've been in there three Sundays now. The first Sunday, we looked at the first six chapters. How did sin enter the world? And under what condition? And then uh, we looked at the next six or seven verses Chris did with us. And we looked at how did our first parents respond to sin with blame shifting and lying and running and hiding and and this morning, we're going to look at Genesis 3 one more time. And I don't have a lot of time because we're going to hear three tremendous testimonies this morning that are the real sermon for today, uh, as well as get to witness the baptism of these nine folks, which is the real sermon. And so I'm going to try to limit myself to 15 minutes. Church, would you pray for me? Pray for your pastor. It's not my, uh, my strength. But I want to show you just one more verse, if I could do that, in Genesis chapter Three. Uh, this particular verse comes in this famous section, verses 14 through 19. And this is the section where God has, has come in. Adam, where are you? He finds him. And uh, this is where God pronounces the curse. What's going to happen as a result of sin entering the world? These five verses, he talks about uh, that the you know, lady's childbirth is going to be painful and it's going to be hard. And, and the whole complementary male-female relationship is going to get twisted. And men, you're going to want to domineer. And women, you're going you're to uh, you know, want for your husband's role. And there will be a, a twisting and a disordering. He talks about uh, you know, the labor of our work on the earth is going to be difficult. And it's going to fight back against us. And, and then he says, you're going to work the dirt all your life. And at the end of your life, you're going to die and you're going to become the dirt that you worked your whole life. And so uh, this is not like positive, encouraging. I mean, this is not, you don't have this on bumper stickers on your car. I promise. This is a, this is a somber area of scripture. But what I love is that right in the midst of it, Right in the midst of God calling down curse, right in the middle of God pronouncing judgment, God himself shows up and speaks to his children that he loves what theologians call the proto-evangelion, the, the first gospel, the first good news. We're going to hear that good news and talk about it. Let me read it to you in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. I'll read it in the NIV. This is God talking to the serpent in the company of the man and the woman. He says this, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. The first gospel. Some very good news comes right in the middle of a very good news passage of scripture. He says to the serpent, I will put enmity, enmity between you and the woman, between uh, your offspring and hers. What he's saying is this, enmity means conflict. It means hostility. It means animosity. You and I are born into a great war. God is saying that, it, that there's going to be two lines, two lineages that can be traced throughout all of human history. Those who love God and follow him and those who follow the devil and rebelling against God. And there will be conflict between these two lines. 
These lines include physical people who are deceived by the devil and as well as spiritual angels in the heavenly realms. And if you continue this uh, reading through Genesis, what you're going to see is that Moses, the narrator, takes this theme of the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent and he traces it throughout the entire book. Moreover, you see this theme of the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent traced throughout all of Scripture. When I was in seminary, I had to write 10 pages tracing the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent through all of Scripture without, reading, without using my Bible. Uh, it was an intimidating task, and I've forgotten all of it. But my point is, you see this motif, and I got an A on the paper, but this is just the way I study. It just comes in and then out. Uh, it's an education issue. Anyway, you see this traced throughout all of scripture all the way up to Matthew when Jesus steps on the scene and you see the genealogy there showing us the seed of the woman. So there's two lines throughout all of scripture. There's Satan trying to elicit people to participate with him in rebellion against God and there is God himself through his people seeking to save us from Satan's sin and death and bring us into the family of God and there's this great conflict and that in the midst of the conflict is where Jesus brings the good news. Look with me again at the second half of Genesis 3.15. It says this. He, this is a male son, that's important. He will crush your head, serpent, and you will strike his heel. City light, this is the first picture in scripture of Jesus Christ. Through the line of the woman, God himself would step down into his creation Galatians 4, 4 says that Jesus Christ is born of woman, following in the line of the, the original woman, Jesus Christ, the seed of the woman, will come and destroy the head of the serpent. Here God promises that Jesus will come and crush our enemy. He says Jesus will be wounded. There will be a bruising to the seed of the woman. He will be bruised, but through the bruising, he will be victorious because his bruise comes on the bottom of his heel as he stomps Satan underfoot. This is incredible. Right in the midst of the worst moment of human history, sin has entered God's perfect creation. Even right there in the midst of the darkness and judgment, confusion and hiding, blaming lies and darkness, separation, right there in the middle, God speaks in and says, I will save my people. You have been duped by the devil, but I will come and destroy the devil. I myself will crush the head of the deceiver. And God's promise and plan in Genesis 3.15 came to its ultimate, ultimate fulfillment in the man Jesus Christ. Satan tempted Adam and Eve in the garden to disobey God, and they did. Satan tempted Jesus Christ in the wilderness for 40 days, and he never sinned. Tempted in every way as you and I are, yet without sin. No sin. Jesus did in his life what you and I and our first parents failed to do. He obeyed the Father perfectly. Then Satan fills Judas Iscariot and brings his plan to execute Jesus, and Jesus goes to the cross. And it looks as though our enemy has won. But through his death, Jesus is bruised, but the head of the serpent is crushed. Jesus on the cross takes the wrath of God in death, not for his own sins, he had none, but for the sins of the world, for all who would believe in him for salvation. Jesus took our place, paying the penalty for our sin, and then rises from the grave, defeating death and the devil through his eternal life. He crushes the head of the serpent. And then Revelation 20 says that Jesus Christ is coming back physically, bodily, to this earth that we now walk. Our Lord is going to return. And on that last day, Revelation 20 says he will take the serpent, which is the devil, and he will bind him and throw him into the pit to deceive the nations no longer. And Revelation says that on that last and consummate day, he will come back and gather his people. And all of the evil, all of the wrongdoing, all of the sin, all of the consequences of you and I's disobedience, all the carnage of terrorism and divorce and death will become undone. Everything that is sad will become untrue, and we will go and live with him in glory forever. Jesus Christ crushes the head of the serpent. The gospel of Jesus 
right in the third chapter of the Bible. This is good news. And what we're going to celebrate this morning is that God is still making that good news known, and he is still saving people one by one. The Bible says that Jesus' victory becomes our victory when we place our faith in him. Not when we become more religious, not when we start attending church more, but when we admit that my goodness is not enough. When we can admit that I have been deceived by the devil, I have believed that I could do this on my own, I had believed that I didn't need forgiveness, I had believed that I didn't need a righteousness other than my own, and we instead come before Jesus and say, I've been deceived, I have sinned, and I need you. I need your perfect life that I was unable to do. I need your atoning death that I deserve to die. Would you forgive me and would you fill me? And what we celebrate this morning is that Jesus has saved these people one by one. Uh, Some of the folks getting baptized have been a Christian for a long, long time, and today is just their baptism day. Some of these folks are brand new Christians that God has just saved. But Jesus saved these people, and we're going to celebrate with you through baptism. Uh, Now, by way of reminder, uh, because I know there's a lot of guests and visitors here, and you might think, well, what is baptism? And maybe my church had a different tradition, and we did it a different way. Um, Let me remind you of this. Baptism saves no one, okay? These tanks we got from Tractor Supply Company. Uh, The water came from a garden hose in the utility closet right there. And Kent McCrimmon spent the night here last night, one of our interns, from 3 till 5 a.m., filled these up and heated them this morning. And so if you're interested in an internship at City Light Church, you raise your own support. We don't pay you. And then you work harder than anyone else. So we're taking applications in the back. Thank you, Kent, uh, for your labor. This is water. You get the same water out of the ice coolers in the back or the drink. This is water. Water doesn't save you. Baptism doesn't save you. Who saves you? Jesus. But what we're going to witness is an amazing illustration, a sermon illustration, a living parable, a, a, a ceremony that symbolically represents on the outside what has already happened on the inside of these people. See, they're going to sit down in that water and they're going to be dry. This represents, this is their old man. This is them without the grace of God. This is them in their own righteousness. This is them deceived by the devil. And they're going to walk into that water. And that old person is what? It's going to be buried down underneath the water. Romans 6 says that this is us saying that we are united with Christ in his death. That just as he died for our sins, so too our old nature, dead with Christ. That guy is not coming back up out of the water anymore. But then, unless I'm feeling cruel, they're going to come back up out of the water. (laughs) And that represents that just as Jesus went into the grave and he rose again victorious, so too these people now have eternal life in Jesus Christ through faith in him. And on that last day, when our Lord comes back, they will raise again in bodily form to be with him for all of eternity. Do you see the illustration? No one's getting saved in that water, but we're going to publicly declare what Jesus has done to save them, and that their old man is dead, and their new person is alive in Jesus Christ. An amazing picture of our Lord, the snake crusher, and his victorious grace in your life. City Light, this is an amazing moment. And so what do you guys do? We're going to We're going to hear some testimonies now, and and we're going to see these baptisms. How do we respond as a church family? I want to encourage you to do three things this morning. Number one, as these testimonies are shared and as these people go into the water, would you just thank God? In the quietness of your seat, um, would you just remember that this is God's good grace in every one of these lives? Um, By God's grace, we've had a lot of baptisms at City Light Church, but my prayer is that we would never take any single one for granted. Each one is a miracle. God has extended his grace and saved you. So would you just thank God? God, would you do more of that? You saved that person. You are so kind, so good. Would you continue to do that? And then would you actually cheer? Would you actually clap your hands? You know, we clap when the Huskers win, which isn't often, but we should save our... (laughs) Our loudest praise for when God wins, amen? Amen. And he has won victorious over these lives. And so I want us to celebrate in in thanksgiving for what he's done and worship of our living God. So number one, celebrate. Number two, I want you to actually ask yourself, have I trusted Christ? This devil that we read about is still real, and he still deceives God's people, and he would still love for you to believe that all this religion is great for the weak. 
but you know, I don't really need that superstition in my life, right? Oh, no, 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 no. What if God is really real? What if this man, Jesus Christ, that our whole calendar is, revolves around, that the world is just captivated by, what if this man, Jesus Christ, really is the Savior of the world? And what if sin and evil really is real? What if salvation is real and available to you this morning by faith? So I want you to ask yourself, have I trusted in Jesus Christ? And if you haven't, maybe God would use a testimony on the stage or someone going into the water that you know uh, to be a means to work into your own life, to say, this is available to you as well. If you would pray and tell Jesus, God, would you forgive me for my sins and would you give me new eternal life, he would gladly take your sins and give you himself and the eternal life that he offers. Third thing I want to ask you is, have you been baptized? The pattern that we see in Scripture is that someone places their faith in Jesus The next thing they do is they get baptized as a Christian. And so as a Christian, as someone who believes in Jesus, have you been baptized? If not, I would encourage you to do so out of obedience to what God tells us to do, that you too might experience this moment, and the devil would love to intimidate you and convince you not to do it. Um, But would you listen to the voice of the Father that would love for you to have this experience? We're not going to do like spontaneous baptisms today, um, but we do baptisms often and frequent in City Light, just in full faith that God's going to save some more. So we're going to have baptisms in February once again right here. We have no one signed up, but we just put it on the calendar, and then we pray like crazy that God would save some, or it's going to be an awkward Sunday. And so uh, maybe you're a new Christian you need to get baptized. Maybe you've been walking with Jesus for 20 years and you just thought, man, it's too late now. You know, what are people going to, no, it's not. No, it's not. Um, Is it time for you to get baptized as well? That's what I would ask you. So City Light, we have a lot to celebrate this morning. Jesus has crushed the head of our enemy and is calling many to himself. Jesus is alive. He is still working and he is still saving. And we're going to see some evidence of that right now. Uh, I'm going to end by praying. I'm going to invite Shauna and Stefan and William up to the stage as I pray. And they're going to share the stories of how Jesus saved them. And uh, then some folks are going to get wet. So let's pray together this morning. Jesus, we know that sin is real. We see it in the headlines. We see it in ourselves. We know that the story in Genesis is more than just religious folklore, but it's anthropology. It's who we are. It's the condition of our hearts. We naturally rebel against you. We don't run to you. We run from you. But in Scripture, we see the picture of a God who is running for us, his rebellious children. And you come into the garden and you preach good news. And you come to the earth and you deliver on that promise when in your body, Jesus Christ, you took our sins. And from the grave you rose victorious to grant us new and eternal life. Thank you for that good news. Thank you, God, that you are still saving. And God, even now, would you just get worship and would you stir our hearts to love and adore you even more as we hear the stories of how you have saved these people from their sins and called them back into relationship with you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Take it away, Shauna. Hi, I'm I'm Shauna. Um, When Gavin said, you know, this could end up on the internet, that's true. I actually put my own baptism on the internet. (laughs) I put it on Facebook. (laughs) earlier. And then, um, not my baptism, but just that I'm here to do this today. And then um, also, I was one of the people that wasn't sure about getting up here on the stage today. Um, This is my third time doing it, so I'm a little bit more comfortable now, and I'm going to share with you a little bit more of my story. Um, I've known about Jesus for a really long time, was was probably introduced to him in preschool, and went to church a lot with my parents and all of that stuff, but I'm very stubborn. And so it took me a while to accept, and it's actually very recent that I've come to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Um, I, the, one of my, my key weaknesses prior to this, this realization and this acceptance was relationships with guys. I love dating, loved uh, dating. <laughs> that was kind of my, my thing. Um, and I, I met a person some time ago who I thought was everything that God wanted me to have in my life. He was superficially great, attractive, intelligent, all of that. The one thing that he didn't have is faith in Jesus. And I thought, you know, that's okay. I'm a new believer. I'm a helper. I can probably fix him. Uh, I can't. I couldn't. 
Um, and it turns out that he ended up being an abusive person. So I was physically assaulted by this individual. And when I was going through that, this is uh, when I realized how, how much God loves me. Um, I prayed to him that this person would not kill me when he was attacking me. I prayed to him that um, while he was verbally abusing me, that I could remind myself of God's truth about me. Um, after it was over, I, um, I uh, prayed for the strength to pursue legal recourse to make sure that this never happened to anyone else again by this individual. After that, I had I had found a way to forgive him, and then I prayed for his own re rehabilitation and and help because this individual needs that too. Um, so, like I said, this was a pretty recent event for me, but I'm just so grateful that God st st stepped in and helped me through that, and I'm forever grateful for that. And getting baptized is the least I can do for what He's done for me. Seriously, Chris. I mean, I had to go after Gavin last time, and now I have to go after that. I mean, she's giving me chills. Get ready to fall asleep, people. <laughs> anyway, my name is William, and I came to know Christ in the third grade, right down the street at Christ Community Church. And since then, my life has really just followed a pattern of unfaithfulness, sin, and rebellion toward God. But in return, it's direct contrast. He has provided me with this unwavering amount of forgiveness, mercy, and grace in my life. And, you know, shortly after I came to Christ, my parents, we picked up and we moved to Tacoma, Washington. And it was not a good neighborhood. There were gangs, violence, drugs, anything you can think of, you name it. And I got really caught up in that. And needless to say, my life started a downward spiral. And it all came to a head when my close friend decided he had had enough and he was going to take his own life. And at that point, I felt empty, I felt alone and hopeless, and I decided I'm gonna take mine as well. And so I went out, and I went out just to do that exact thing, and I ended up staring right down that dark abyss that we call suicide. But God showed up and miraculously saved me. And I wish I could tell you all the details. Like if anybody wants to know, we can talk at the church, grab coffee or something, because it's a beautiful story, but we only have this much time. Um, after God saved my life, I really, it opened my eyes and I saw that I needed Jesus in my life every single day. And I needed God to continually rework my heart until I was completely submissive to his perfect will. You know, you get up here and you give testimonies and you talk a lot about, you know, who you were before you met Christ. And I really don't remember. I was in the third grade, you know, so I'm going to guess that I was a sinful, disobedient, rebellious child. You know, that's what we are in the third grade, right? And now I'm standing up here with you today, and I'm like, well, who am I today with Christ in my life? And it, it's, it's really embarrassing, but I'm still a sinful, disobedient, and rebellious child. But the difference is now I belong to a loving father, and he calls to me, and he pursues me, and he grants me eternal life through the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. And in response to that, I love Jesus more than anything. And I see every single day as this opportunity to replace my rebellion with a growing faith in Jesus. And I look back to wanting to take my life. It was November. It was about this time of year. And Jesus really spoke one message to me and one message very clearly. And he said, you belong to me now. And your life, that's no longer yours to take. Amen? Amen. Let's get dunked. Well, my name is Stefan, and I grew up going to a Lutheran church. We attended church regularly, but after I was, um, after confirmation, I was given the choice of whether or not I wanted to go to church, and more often than not, I chose not to go. To be honest, I thought church was boring, and I never understood what it had to do with me. To me, church was just checking the box. I knew the words to say, and I sang the hymns, but I never really felt a personal connection to the message. And so, although I always believed in God, for many years, I didn't regularly attend church. But about two and a half years ago, we started coming to City Light. 
And week after week, I was just blown away. It was like I was hearing the word for the first time. I was amazed with how much applied to my everyday life. And although I'd grown up hearing that Jesus loves me, I started to see that it's not just a catchy phrase. Jesus really does love me. And I started to develop a personal relationship with him. I wanted to read my Bible and learn more about him. But what I started to see is that I didn't think that I needed Jesus. My life was going really well. I had a wonderful husband, two great kids who were smart and well-behaved. I had a good job, a good family, and all of that was without me believing in Jesus. It was all about me and what I was doing, and I thought I was doing things right. But what I also started to see is that that's not enough. There is nothing that I could ever do that could make me deserving of God's love. I am 100%, without a doubt, a sinful person. And without Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross, there is nothing I could do that would make me worthy of God's love. And that was a really humbling realization for me because I've always thought of myself as good and smart and capable. But I was also filled with such gratitude and love that Jesus was willing to make that sacrifice on my behalf so that I could be worthy in God's eyes. So I started thinking about getting baptized about a year ago. I felt like God was calling me to um, get baptized as a symbol of the change that had happened in my heart. But I had a lot of doubt and fear. I was really worried about what people would think. And so I told myself things like, well, I was baptized as an infant, so that's probably good enough. And baptism isn't required for salvation, so I don't really need to do it. But more and more, while that's true, I just felt like God was calling me to get baptized. And so today was the day that I stopped running and decided to follow God's direction.